Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today is going to be a fun episode with my longtime friend Steve Chappell of Zero Hunt Fees and Elk Camp TV and Chapel Guide Service. Steve, how you doing? I'm doing really good, Jay. Happy New Year to you. I'm glad to be on with you here in 2019. Yeah, for sure. You know, we start out this year, and right off the bat, I know your phone's been blowing up. Um, Right off the bat, we've got the Arizona elk and antelope regulations just came out in the last few days, and uh, we've got this deadline the second Tuesday in uh, February, I believe, on the 12th, and so I know you've been talking to a lot of hunters with your Zero Hunt Fees program, and I wanted to get your take on uh, these regulations. So we're going to have a fun chat today. Before we get into that, Steve, um, just I want to uh, have you give the listeners kind of a brief overview of last season, Uh, obviously drought and what have you, but uh, hopefully it's one of those seasons we can put in our rearview mirror. But uh, give kind of a 30,000-foot view of this past season, and then we'll dive into these new regulations. Yeah, you bet, Jay. And I'm so glad to see that this year is starting off very different than 2018 because that was definitely a drought for the ages. And, uh, you know, we virtually didn't have moisture until July. You know, thankfully, we picked up monsoon in July and August and September and, you know, greened things up and allowed the animals to go into the winter more healthy. But it definitely impacted antler growth, and especially in the more arid units, you know, more in the north and northwest part of the state was impacted the most. And then I felt like it even had a lingering effect on the rut and kind of made the, the bugling spotty and hit and miss, which isn't too uncommon, but um, I think it definitely uh, did have an effect. You know, we were able to still do well um, Overall, you know, I wouldn't say that, that, that we killed the kind of bulls that we typically would. It was very hard, you know, to find 350 and better bulls, no doubt, uh, because of the drought. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, we were still able to adapt. Uh, you know, in some cases, we had to glass on the archery hunt to find nice bulls to hunt. We did that and, uh, you know, still came out of the year uh, feeling pretty good about it and uh, <laughs> definitely anticipating 2019 to be, you know, I, I think it's shaping up to be a stellar year, to be honest. Yeah, you know, with those um, a bunch of bulls that probably got passed because their back ends just weren't very good, you know, puts another uh, year on those bulls, and um, they're probably going to be in, in much better shape going into this year. It seems like we've gotten pretty widespread moisture, so... Um, well, let's hope that it can just continue and we have a really good uh, winter and spring here and, uh, you know, we, we all can be optimistic about this coming year. Uh, Steve, I want to start out, uh, you do a really good job with your Zero Hunt Fees program uh, in talking to all of your members and what have you, and you've done an application DVD in the past and, and have a really good knowledge of the Arizona elk draw and how it works, all the intricate details. Uh, would you please, for the listener out there, uh, you know, give give a summary of the process that you go through to draw an elk tag in the state of Arizona and kind of how that works? You bet, Jay. Um, there's, you know, a few things to know about it off the top. The first thing to know about it is that if you're a non-resident, there's a 10% cap in the draw. So if you have a hunt that has 100 bull tags, uh, up to 10 of those can go to non-residents. And the biggest thing to know as a non-resident is that in 2016, the Game and Fish adjusted the non-resident part of the draw. Before, all 10 of those non-resident tags that I just mentioned on a hunt with 100 total tags would go to people with high bonus point totals, and it was just a fact that if you didn't have high bonus points, you were not going to draw. Well, in 2016, the Game and Fish changed the draw to where only 50% of those tags will go to the highest bonus point holders. So of 10 tags, only five of those will go to the highest point holders, and then the other five are available in the random draw to anyone with any bonus point total. So someone with any point total can potentially draw any tag on any given year. Um, The next thing to know about the draw is that Arizona has a five-choice system However, only your first two choices come into play when you're applying for bull elk hunts. um, Just the bottom line is with the three-phase draw, 
by the time they get to your third, fourth, and fifth choices, the bull tags are long gone. So the three phases are, uh, the first phase of the draw is the bonus point pass where they issue the first 20% of the tags to the highest bonus point holders who apply for a particular hunt. And of, like I was just alluding to earlier, they changed the non-resident side of the draw. So now in that 20% bonus point phase of the draw, 15% are of, the, of the tags are, excuse me, 15 of the 20% are, go to residents and 5% of the 20% go to non-residents, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, so half of that non-resident quota is taken there. Um, okay, after they've issued that first 20% of the tags in the bonus point round, then they come to the random part of the draw, and that's where the majority of us and your listeners would draw a tag if you don't have high bonus points. And what they do in that phase of the draw is that they issue uh, the computer's got a random number generating program and it issues you random numbers according to how many bonus points you have. So if, if a guy has three bonus points, he gets three random numbers generated for his bonus points plus one more for his application. The reason it gives you that extra one for your application is because there are applicants with zero bonus points, and those guys get one random number generated for their application. So to be fair to everyone, that's how it does it. So then after it's finished, issuing random numbers to everyone who's in the draw, it, it selects the lowest random number that it generates. Let's say, you know, Jay, that, that we have three bonus points, and it issues, issues us four random numbers. The computer will select the lowest one of the four, assign that one number to you, and it does that for everyone according to how many points they have. But... At the point that it's, it's uh, you know, given you that one random number and selected that one random number, then you are ranked by random number only. It does not matter at that point how many points you have or had. You're ranked by random number only, and then the computer, in the process of the draw, it starts with the lowest random number, considers that applicant's first and second choices, then moves on to the next random number, and so on from, from lowest to highest. So as you can see, the lower random number you get assigned to you, the better your chances are of getting a good tag. And I should mention also, our draw is unique in that when it comes to your application in the sequence of random numbers, it considers your first choice first, obviously. Let's say that you have uh, your first choice is a Unit 23 North Early Rifle. It's going to consider that choice first. If there's tags available for that hunt, it's going to issue you that tag. If not, let's say you have the Unit 9 Early Muzzleloader Hunt as your second choice. It will go immediately and consider Unit 9 Early Muzzleloader to see if there's a tag available for you on that hunt before it goes to the next applicant's first choice and even considers that. So you can very conceivably draw your first or your second choice with the way our draw works. And that's kind of a <laughs> technical overview of the draw right there. Yeah, and one thing to point out, Steve, explain the fact, and let's just take, like, I'm looking at the Go Hunt Insider, the draw odds mm -hmm. just got released yesterday. Yeah. And let's just take, for instance, Unit 1, and, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, 17 points is a 100% draw for the archery hunt. Um, so, so let's say that you've got a guy and he's got 19 bonus points, okay? Yes. And he's going to apply, let's say, for a Unit 1... Um, a, a unit one archery tag, and he says, I'm going to swing for the fence on the unit nine tag because it takes 21 points. Yeah, I'm, I'm not looking at it, but I'm guessing it's like 20 or 21. If, let's say it's higher than unit yep. one. Yes. And then you, I'm going. looking at the odds here for unit one, and it says 17, and he says, but I'll put that as my second choice. Now, he's got 19. So, in other words, he has enough points to draw his second choice. What happens in that situation? Because people don't understand that. Yes, that's a very good point that you make, Jay. Somebody who's applying, they need to consider their bonus points, and they need to look at stats like that, like you're talking about Go Hunt there. Because what happens in that scenario is the bonus point phase of the draw, like I just talked about, is the first phase of the draw, and that's where they're issuing tags based on bonus points. 
And in that phase of the draw, just like in the random phase, the computer considers both your first and your second choice when it's issuing tags based on bonus points. So if you have 19 points and you list Unit 9 Archery first and Unit 1 Archery second, you are going to get that Unit 1 Archery tag in the bonus point phase of the draw. So in other words, you've given yourself no chance to draw Unit 9 because you're going to be issued that tag automatically in the bonus point round. So that is a very good point. As you build more bonus points, you've got to be very um, you know, concerned and, and consider what you're applying for because you can very well draw in the bonus point pass even on your second choice and never give yourself the chance to get that home run hunt, so to speak. Yeah, and I think my example of Unit 9 and Unit 1 maybe isn't as good because they're both, you know, say in the top five units of the state, but I've had every year someone say, well, I swung for the fence for a 23 tag, uh, but I went ahead and put a, you know, 5B North that might only take seven oh. or eight points, and, you know, they've got 13 or 14 points, and it's like, yeah. you, just, you just wasted six or seven points of excess on a unit that does not take near that many. Right. And they, and they don't get it. They're like, no, I put in Unit 9 as my, or 23 or whatever as my first. That's, I swung for the fence, and I'm like, no, you, you put in 13 points that you had for it for a tag that only takes seven or eight or nine and they're like yeah, are you serious and they're like i drew i want you know i'm not guiding in the state of arizona for elk uh this coming year but the, the conversation usually goes well i want to hire you and i'm like well i don't do 5b and they're like yeah. well no i it could be unit nine and i'm like how many bonus points i had 13 well no you <laughs> automatically drew your second choice yeah, pack your bags, you're going to 5B. Exactly. What we need to understand is that that draw computer does not have a personality whatsoever. Um, it doesn't understand our terminology of swinging for the fence, and it can't, you know, reason with us and say, oh, yeah, that, this guy put it for this hunt because he's smart and he swung for the fence by putting 23 north first and 5B north second. It, you know, it's, it just goes by numbers if you know what i'm saying there's, yeah there's no reasoning there in a computer so yeah something to really consider and um, i hope your listeners really key in on this because there is a difference just like in any state you know someone who lives in new mexico would agree that a unit in the gila like 16d is definitely way different than unit two or unit six up in the northern part of the state. It's the same way in our state. Um, you know, all units are not created equal. Um, there's a reason why uh, we call certain units premier units, and, you know, they're harder to draw, but you see year in and year out bigger bulls coming out of them, and a higher success rate is the big thing that I see, especially on the archery hunts on, in the better units. Yeah, for sure. Steve, talk a little bit about those premier units as you see them. Um, regardless of how anyone else or even the game and fish sees them. Talk about the premier units and then talk about kind of those mid-tier, mid-level units, um, you know, in, in kind of a brief overview of how you categorize those units. You, you bet, Jay. Um, first, I would say the premier units, it's probably no secret to a lot of people, I would classify those as 9 and 10 and 3C and 1 and 23 north and south. Um, it, the reason those, in my opinion, are what I call top tier premier units is first off because there's, there's usually good bugling in those units. Um, most times when you go out, if conditions are decent for moisture and such, you're going to have good bugling on the archery and the early firearms hunts. Um, that's what I love about those units. And then secondarily is you're just going to have um, overall a higher density of bigger bulls. And, you know, when I say big bulls, I'm saying 330 and better bulls. Um, even in our better units, um, it, 350 bulls are not common anymore. Um, we've had, had a little bit of a slip in quality over the last decade. Still, there's good bulls to be had, but, you know, someone who thinks they're going to go out and see a 350 bull every day or every other day, it's just not a reality really anymore. Um, 
but again, what I love the most is the fact that the bugling is better. It bears that out in the statistics. If you look at the success rates for archery hunts especially, you'll see that most times these better units that I mentioned run 40s to 60% success, sometimes even higher, like in, the, in 23. Uh, then if you step to the mid-tier units, which I would uh, classify 7 West, 27, and 8 for the most part in that mid-tier, um, you're still going to have, you know, a, a overall a good a good age class of bulls, good good size bulls. Again, you know, 320 plus bulls to be had, um, but you're going to have to sort through lots of 280 to 310 kind of bulls in those units. But the biggest thing that I see in in units like that is just spotty, unpredictable rutting activity, where you know you can be on a 14 day hunt and sometimes maybe only have three or four days of good bugling can be kind of frustrating. Um, and again, that's bared out in the success rates. You're going to normally see success rates in the 20s and 30s on those type of hunts. And uh, kind of the same holds for, you know, what I call uh, lower tier units. Um, those would be like 5B South, 5B North, 5A, 4A, 3B, uh, you know, 4B, just, just all the other ones that are left, 6A. Um, Again, always the chance for a great bull, no doubt, um, but, but they're fewer and far between. Um, it's mostly going to be, you know, 280 to 300 to 310 kind of bulls on those hunts. And again, very uh, unpredictable bugling and rutting activity. And, you know, Jay, overall, I don't really know the reason for that and what to attribute that to. Um, you know, they do say that they manage those premier units for higher bull to cow ratios, um, you know, many of those units are uh, are next to Indian reservations, and I think that definitely helps with tro trophy quality and uh, kind of sanctuary, and, and and makes for some good rutting activity. Um, but overall, it's hard to explain that dynamic of spotty bugling and rutting activity. But it is very real. I've noticed over the years. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we always get a first-hand look whenever we end up in some of those units that are not the premier units. And, you know, it yeah. seems as though there is a huge difference. And people need to understand that Arizona, like you said, and we I've talked about on other podcasts that I've been doing here on this, on this uh, you know, upcoming year, is you said it perfectly. Arizona, over the last 10 years, the quality has slipped. The age class has slipped. You know, and people say, well, what happened? Well, I think you look at, you know, numbers of tag allocations and tag increases. I think you look at drought. Um, seems like we're always in a, a drought of some sort. But I think overall the numbers of bulls being shot is probably the number one thing to blame. And then you've got the predator issue. Um, but I still go back to, uh, you know, hunters being able to have opportunity uh, is a great thing, but it has, it has its consequences, and those consequences are that our age class has diminished and our bulls have declined in size and in age. And, you know, one of the things I think we need to really be careful about is Arizona has built its niche as, you know, the elk hunting capital of the world for size. And, yeah. you know, I think Colorado has gone through some of this as well, where they were the, you know, still have the most elk of any state. And it's like, man, you deplete that resource so much, you know, you, you basically are biting the hand that's feeding you. You've got to watch yeah. that you protect. And, and you know, if, if somebody's going to go hunt on, in Colorado on an OTC tag and go year after year and never see an elk and never hear an elk bugle, well, guess what? It's not going to take them long where they decide that they're going to go, you know, fly a kite or do play golf. Like, they're going <laughs> to yeah. do something different. And I think yeah. the game, you know, this is me talking on the editorial uh, side of things, that all these game management uh, agencies have got to really watch that resource. And, you know, it, it always gets talked about that it's a public resource and what have you. But, I mean, we really need to watch that we don't ask for so much opportunity that uh, the quality of the hunt diminishes so much that people just don't want to go. Because then we've really done it. Um, and it's Absolutely. hard to turn that ship around where you have a great hunt and great hunting opportunity and bring people back into the sport. Well, people wonder, well, why are people, you know, 
leaving hunting and leaving fishing. Well, as the experience diminishes, we're going to lose people. So, I mean, that's always something that I'm thinking about. Steve, I'm Absolutely. looking here. I'm looking here at the Go Hunt Insider, and one thing that's interesting, I'm just looking at Unit 9 for an example. Um, I look here, and what I like about this is it shows 2015, 16, 17, and 18. And in 2015, 18 points as a non-resident was a guaranteed for Unit 9 archery tag. Well, what's interesting is the next year it jumped to 19 the next year it jumped to 20, and this year, this last year, it's 21. So, I mean, it's uh-huh. we're basically a three-point difference in, from 2015 uh, just in that unit. Uh, if I take, uh, let's just take a unit 3A3C here, uh, in 2015 it was a 14-point guaranteed draw, 100%. Uh, then it jumped all the way to 16 in, in 2016. Then it jumped to 17 in 2017, and it jumped to 18. Um, so in in your mind, you know, the way that the change in 2016 where 5% go to the max point holders in that unit and then 5% go completely random, it's only obvious that that point creep for the higher point holders is going to continue to go up, correct? Yes. Yes, you're exactly right, Jay, and that is exactly attributed to that adjustment that they made in the draw. So now with only 50% of the tags for non-residents, we should say, for non-residents being taken in that bonus point pass, that just means there's kind of a log jam of bonus points because you're not clearing out as many high point holders per year. So that is why that point creep has become one point per year, whereas in the past it seemed to be more like one point every other year. But that's that's what's going on. You know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Um, that by making that adjustment, they made it possible for anyone with any point total to draw any tag on any given year, which I think is a great thing. But right. on the other side of on the other side of the coin, these guys that had points that were real close to drawing tags, it kind of keeps the carrot dangling and, and and running away from them just a little bit. Um, but overall, I I, I definitely um, applaud the game and fish for making that adjustment because I think systems that just turn into total bonus point or or preference point, if you want to call it that, where it's all about your points, and if you don't have the points, you just don't get a tag. It really discourages people from applying. So I think our system is the best of both worlds because it has that element of fairness with the bonus point pass of the draw and then that element of, of randomness and excitement knowing that you could draw any tag. Well, yeah, and I think, uh, you know, also, let's talk about the money. I mean, by doing that change of, you know, 5% and 5%, it opens up the draw to so many more people that would say, normally, I'm not even going to apply because I'll never have a chance to draw a great unit. Well, now 5% of those tags go completely random. So I am all for the game and fish. They have to manage the resource. Like, they need money. If anybody out there does not realize that they are strapped for money at all times, like, they need as much money as they can. So I thought that was a great way to increase the number of people that are applying, but there's always consequences for every action. And I think, you know, it creates more opportunity for those people that don't have those max points, which is fantastic, but what has it also done? It's taken some of those people with the higher point totals, and it's, like you said, dangled the carrot just out of reach every year. <laughs> yeah. um, and yeah. it, it creates those people in the, you know, 20, 21, 19 type bonus points where they're like, well, maybe I'm not going to keep chasing the Unit 9. Maybe I'll do a 3C. Maybe I'll do a, you know, a, 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 a Unit 10. I'll do something. And, and you yeah. know, they have to decide that. Um, Steve, I want to take a quick second here uh, before I kind of, I'm going to have you, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot and ask you, like, your favorite units and uh, potentially maybe in order and have you kind of talk a little bit about them and maybe what people can expect for quality in those units. But before we do that, I want to thank the sponsors of the podcast. Um, And as you know, with your Elk uh, Camp TV, uh, sponsors are a very important important part of, of, you know, our programs here. Yeah. And I wouldn't be able to devote the time I do to this podcast without the sponsors. And I get 
messages a lot on my Instagram and emails, people wanting to know, you know, what can they, Jay, you know, you, you do so much for the public, and, and I'm humbled by that. What can we do for you? Well, my simple answer is support the sponsors that, that support this show. And those sponsors are GoHunt.com. My friend Cody Nelson, of uh, 20 plus years, Steve, you know Cody well, uh, yep. is the optics manager over there at GoHunt.com, and he's in charge of the optics department there in the gear shop. And we've done several great podcasts, uh, and we have. I just recorded a, several more with him yesterday. He's, I call him the glassing guru. He's the optics authority, and. Uh, if you need any binos, tripods, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, any optical needs at all, give Cody a call at 702-847-8747. That's extension 2. You can also send him an email directly at optics at gohunt.com. He has promised me, and he's already uh, been true to his word, that he is taking care every day of the J. Scott Outdoors podcast listeners. So, Make sure you mention me, and uh, he'll take care of you over there. I want to thank Go Hunt for their sponsorship. As I was saying with Steve, also the Go Hunt Insider just released their uh, Arizona elk and antelope draw odds, uh, and I've been going through them last night and even this morning, and it's it's really neat to be able to go back and look at the comparisons from 15, 16, 17, and 18. Uh, and, you know, I'm diving through some of the stats here, and it's the most in-depth uh, stats that you can find. Uh, guys, if you're not a Go Hunt Insider member, you can go to GoHunt.com forward slash J. Scott, and you get a $50 uh, Go Hunt gift sh- gear shop gift card uh, just for signing up. So go check that out. It's also linked up uh, on the show notes of this podcast. I want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. That's K-U-I-U dot com. Uh, the, the clothing and gear that I wear on all my hunts, uh, the best ultralight hunting gear on the market. Go check them out. I also want to thank Canyon Coolers based right out of Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, if you use the J. Scott or the J. Scott 19 promo code, you're going to get a 10% discount. I want to thank Canyon Coolers for their support. I want to thank Phonescope.com, Cheston Davis uh, over there. All the phone scoping, all the video and photos that you see of animals on my Instagram are taken with the phone scope. Uh, and if you use the J. Scott uh, 18 or 19 right now, we're in a transition, uh, you get a 10% discount. Uh, and then Onyx Maps. Uh, Onyx Maps is a, the newest sponsor of the podcast. They've been with me a couple months now. If you use the J. Scott 19 promo code, you're going to get a 20% discount. I'm headed off to Mexico here in a few days, and I'm excited that Onyx Maps, the aerial portion, works down there. And I've uploaded everything from my Google Earth onto my Onyx. And uh, when I was scouting down there a couple weeks ago, was able to have all my roads, water tanks, all my glassing points, everything on my Onyx map, be able to zoom in on those high-resolution maps, be able to use the breadcrumb feature, the line distance feature, just just an awesome uh, awesome yeah. app. Check it out. Use the J. Scott uh, 19 promo code. Get a 20% discount. Steve, as we move forward here in our conversation, uh, obviously you get asked every day with your Zero Hunt Feeds program, uh, you get people wanting to know what they should apply for. Uh, before... I have you give me, say, your top five units or top three units, whatever you want to do. Um, I want you to tell me and the listeners about your Zero Hunt Fees program and what all it is involved with that. You bet, Jay. Um, you know, it really came into, into existence because of that change in the draw in 2016, because of the fact that now it's just not all about bonus points and, and people can conceivably draw random tags and we have that happen every year. Matter of fact, the very hunter who I guided in 2016 in Unit 9 turn, turned around and drew Unit 1 archery this past year in 2018 with two points as a non-resident. So that's the reason for this program. So what Zero Hunt Fees is, it's a, it's a program where a non-resident can pay $349 a year Basically, that $349 a year gets them hunt application consultation every single year, 
So I will go through the hunts with them, advise them on what I feel like they should apply for. Um, you know, on their contract, typically they'll have a lot of hunts that they can choose from, um, but we'll talk about the various hunts, you know, top tier, mid tier, lower tier, and ultimately it will be their decision on what they apply for, but it's based on, you know, you know me <laughs> consulting with them. I help them through the application process, and then if they're one of the lucky ones to draw a tag, uh, their hunt is covered with their membership, so they have no more to pay. So, uh, matter of fact, we had two first-year members draw in 2018 and three second-year members uh, drew in 2018 and went on hunts with us based on their membership, no more due for the hunt. So, um, what it does is it opens up the opportunity for someone who would love to come hunt Arizona, but it's just a little uneasy with the application process. And then also, of course, if they were to draw a tag, to just have, you know, something insurmountable and in trying to figure out a unit, know where to go, know where to hunt, uh, you know, know how to call, all of that stuff that goes into, in, into doing well on an elk hunt. You know, their membership takes care of all of that because they get a fully outfitted hunt uh, when they draw an Arizona tag. Um, so in my opinion, for the, for the low expense of that yearly, I just don't see a downside to it. If, if people ask me what's the catch, well, the catch is if there is one is that you have to draw a tag. Um, but if you draw a tag, you're going on a fully outfitted hunt with us, and uh, your membership pays for that, and you're not paying, you know, six, seven, eight thousand dollars for a guided hunt. Um, and and I like the fact that it just opens up the potential for someone to go on a dream hunt regardless of their budget. So that's what zero hunt fees is all about. That's awesome that you had a couple first timers. I mean, so here you've got guys that pay three hundred and fifty bucks, and the two of them, their very first year, they're going on a you know six seven thousand dollar guided hunt for three hundred and fifty bucks. <laughs> yeah, it was a father and son, and they drew drew tags together, and they both killed nice bulls, and uh, were tickled to death about it. And I don't blame them. <laughs> yeah. Now I do have a question um, because I'm sure it comes up. Let's mm -hmm. say that there's someone out there listening and they're a non-resident, and let's say they're a very high point holder, so they've got yeah. a ton of points. Uh, is that really fair if they have you know 21 points and they go, well, I'm going to put in for 3C, and you know it's a guaranteed draw? How do you, how do you kind of work? Is there like a point level that you know that that's that that guided hunt is 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 tiered or anything like that? Yeah, Jay, that's a good point, and you're exactly right. I do have to manage my risk, obviously, otherwise I would go broke, because I do, whether I'm guiding the hunt personally or one of my guides is guiding the hunt, I pay the guides the same amount if they're guiding a standard hunter or a, or a zero hunt fees member. So their motivation level is exactly the same to guide that person. That's the first thing I want to say. But you are correct. If someone comes to me with 20 bonus points with the idea that they're going to take advantage and put in for a hunt that they're guaranteed to draw the very first year, I just, yeah, the program doesn't work that way. You know, if they've built right. 20 points, they've obviously been very selective in what they've applied for up to this point. So that's the first thing I ask them is, well, what have you applied for in the past and what are your expectations uh, for the hunt? You're obviously, you know, in my opinion, hoping for a 350-plus bull uh, on an early firearms-type hunt. So somebody in that category, you know, I would limit them to better units on early firearms hunts. Um, you know, I will take on people, though, that, you know, say have 16, 17, 18, 19 points. I would let a person like that apply for Unit 9 Archery. Absolutely. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, I am very reasonable about it, but like I said, I also have to measure my risk. I mean, it would kind of be like being a car insurance salesman and have a drunk stagger into the office to buy car insurance <laughs> and you say, yeah, absolutely. A sign, a sign <laughs> yeah. up right here, drive away. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, for sure. For Just sure. Different well, scenario, but, but similar, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, for right. sure, for sure. I'm sure I, I knew you had some sort of system to be able to handle that to, to mitigate your potential risk of, of, you know, getting taken advantage of. Well, that's an awesome uh, program. I'm glad it's going well for you. Uh, Steve, uh, in talking about uh, some of these top tier units, uh, if you would, um, I'd, I'd prefer it if you, you know, maybe give me 
you know, your favorite units in order, and it may not be biggest bowls. It may be because of something else you like or what have you, but if you could rank, and let's talk archery elk uh, first, rank your, rank your units and maybe talk a little bit about each one and why, you know, they would fall in such an order. And you may have, you know, a top two, and then there's three that are a tie. I mean, just tell me what your thoughts are on those top tier units. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, and every year this can change just a little for me. Um, I would say overall, I always just go back to loving Unit 9. <laughs> I just really do. I, I have a lot of history in there. I just have a love for that unit because of the way it's laid out um, with, you know, pine country and then pinion juniper country and then, you know, lots of broken country. Um, I just think that unit is such a sweet unit to hunt. Um, you know, with that comes, you know, sometimes people with tags, there's extra people and such, and there can be competition at water. But overall, if I had a dream tag, it would be in Unit 9 this year <laughs> because yeah. it's shaping up to be a good year. I would want it to be on a good moisture year, like 2018 would not have been a good year to have 9. Um, right. But I'm telling you, in second... I would say two units come to mind that would be very close for me, and that would be 23 North and 10. Um, what I like about 23 North is I'm never disappointed with the bugling in that unit. Uh, you and yeah. I have talked about how we refer to that as the Jurassic Park unit of Arizona. And yeah. I'm just all about calling and interaction, close interaction with the bulls. And to have that, you've got to have them bugling. And I just really feel like year in and year out, that is the best unit for bugling. So, you know, that one really ranks right up there for me. could even be number one at times. Um, unit 10, I, I love, but it's also got to have the right conditions. You've got to have decent moisture. Um, that unit can be real susceptible to drought. But on the right year, um, you can have great bulls. You can have just an absolute scream fest uh, during the archery and early rifle hunts. Uh, so I do love that unit. Um, you know, the roads are a little <laughs> rough in that unit, so that's not a sweet part of that getting around. And on the Bokeish, you're not allowed to use any ATVs or UTVs, so your, your, your vehicle, your truck kind of takes the hit for that because um, it is kind of hard to get around in that unit. Um, but I do like the fact um, that the Bokeas, I don't think it's such a bad thing that they're not allowing trail cameras on water sources. They're not allowing us to sit on water, which makes that a, a, a caller's unit, in my opinion. Um, so on the right year, um, which, which this one's shaping up to be, Unit 10 is right up there as well. Um, then next would probably, for me, be 3A, 3C. Um, I, I do like that unit a lot. Uh, there's a lot of variety in that unit. You've got burn, you've got pine country, you've got PJ country that you can hunt in and call in. Um, I can't say that overall I'm a huge fan of hunting in big burns, especially with archery equipment, especially when after years have gone by and you get a lot of that blowdown going on. It just makes it a little difficult to, you know, get tight on bulls and call to them. And that's probably one of the reasons that 3C is, you know, not my top. Um, but many times that one would be, you know, second on my application. Um, you know, again, most times, most, most years if things are normal, you're going to have good enough bugling activity on that hunt to do very well. Um, then I would say probably Unit 1, although uh, I was in Unit 1 this past year, and I love the unit. It's beautiful. It's got everything from classic high country with aspens and fir and spruce, you know, all the way down to low pinion cedar juniper stuff. Um, but what I was kind of disappointed in in Unit 1 uh, was a couple of things. First off was the trophy quality. I just felt like gosh, 95% of the bulls that you encountered were, you know, 270 to maybe 300. And most bulls that were running harems that had cows were 300 and sub-300 bulls. So it was very difficult to find even 330-plus bulls on the hunt. And then also there was an issue with uh, just crowding. Uh, you know, you've got 300 tags where historically that unit had 150 tags prior to the burn uh, in 2011, I think, was the burn. Um, and then with 75 cow tags added on to the 
bull tags plus you have fall recreationalists out there because unit one is just such a beautiful place up in the white mountains uh there's just lots of human act activity out there and it, it, it's a little hard and a little frustrating to deal with that um, and that's probably why unit one is you know more like my my fifth pick but still up there you know in those top units and that's that's basically how i rank them yeah i i think that's a uh, a good rank um, one of my questions is this year uh, 3C is the lucky recipient of the firearm <laughs> season before the archery season. Um, Steve, the full moon is the 14th of September, which the archery hunt starts on the 13th, but talking specifically in 3C, that firearms hunt will go, you know, on Friday the 13th, and then that full moon will obviously be full on, on the next day. Um, talk a little bit about your thoughts on that firearms hunt going before the archery and what you anticipate both for that firearms hunt and how will the archery hunt play out uh, after that. Great point, Jay. You don't miss anything. <laughs> that was uh, <laughs> something that really jumped out at me when I looked at the regs when they came out the other day. When I first looked at the early firearms hunts and I saw that, boom, 3A and 3C, with 13th through 19th and the first thing that I thought is just like on the unit 9 muzzleloader hunt a few years back I feel like that hunt is going to be disappointing and lackluster compared to what it usually is when it's at the end of September and into early October I believe that with the full moon and the early dates that the rutting could be very hit and miss and potentially not really going by that point also, another consideration is many of the trophy bulls that come into that unit 3C, they're going to come over from the White Mountain Apache Reservation to rut, and it just seems like the later into the month of September we get, the more of those bulls come over that, that reservation boundary and into 3C. And with that hunt ending on the 19th, I just don't feel like, you know, the bulk of those bulls are going to get over into 3C by that time. So I really feel like that hunt is going to be, you know, kind of a disappointment, but that the archery hunt could just be absolutely stellar. That really stood out to me because I've always said that I feel like from about, you know, the 22nd on into early October is the best 10 days or so of the rut. And that is right when that archery hunt is centered around. And I feel like yeah. with, you know, the full moon happening on the 14th, being on the waning side to going dark, bulls coming over from the White Mountain, cows coming into heat, gosh, that, that, that tag would be a tag that I would want to have this fall, that 3C archery tag. I think it will be phenomenal. I, I totally agree with everything you're saying how much weight do you put on the pressure that the rifle hunters will put on them, or are you of the thought that potentially the rut won't be going good enough for them really to put a, a big damper on it because they're not cranking because of the full moon? It will almost be like a non-issue. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah, Jay, that's kind of what I think. If they're not bugling hard, it's hard for even rifle hunters to get on them and put hard pressure on them. And another thing about 3C, 3A and 3C, is it's not overall a real glassers kind of unit. So that's where the struggle would be, is if they're not bugling well, there's limited glassing in that unit, and it could just be a struggle. And yeah, I kind of feel like that rifle hunt for the most part will be just a non-issue because I think when cows start coming into heat and conditions are right and if these elk are healthy going into, into the fall come September 22nd 23rd 24th they're, they're going to scream regardless yeah yeah Steve uh, let's transition to the late elk hunts I know at chapel guide service uh, and zero zero hunt fees I know you do late hunts in Arizona as well um, what are a couple of your top picks for late late hunt units? You bet, Jay. This, to me, is where not all units are created equal comes into play. <laughs> and I have a saying, I don't know if you've heard me say this before, but I have a saying that goes, friends don't let friends apply for late hunts in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the reason I say that... I think that you and I have been around many campfires <laughs> saying the exact same thing. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> the reason I say that is because at the end of many late hunts, you don't know whether to be angry and frustrated or ecstatic, even when you've killed a bull. Because, I mean, these bulls go to the roughest, worst, toughest parts of these units during the late season. And there's a reason why they survive and, you know, get to be five years and older. And it's because they're not standing out in easy, accessible areas during these late hunts. So first off, you have to pick a unit that's laid out topography-wise that lends itself to good late hunting and glassing. And in my opinion, those units would be 23, 27, 1, and 10. Um, and on a little lesser scale, uh, unit 8 and unit 6A, um, what you want to look for in these units are units that have canyon country because you can, you can glass these, these areas that have canyons. You can especially get above and glass down on bulls. Um, it seems like if you're in units where there's just mountains only and there's no canyons, they, they just run up into the worst, thickest, worst mountains in the unit, and you just can't root them out of there. Um, a unit that comes to mind would be 7 West, which I've spent some time in and have been super frustrated on the late hunt because of that. Um, so, yeah, in my opinion, uh, what were those four units, 23, 27, 1, and 10, in my yeah. opinion, and, and then on a lesser degree, 8 and 6A. And let me tell you something, you better put – put your big boy pants on if you go to hunt 8 and 6A because the canyons yeah. in those units are absolutely nasty. If you kill a bull uh, in some of those canyons, uh, you're going to be considering calling in a chopper to get out. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, um, I believe we met each other in 1996, and we've, um, you know, that's 23 years. I can't believe it. You still look the same, but I'm getting older every day. Uh, you're, you're the, you're the best elk caller I know. And, um, I, I, I want to talk to you about elk camp TV before, before we do that, I can't help ever have you on the podcast and not talk about your calls, um, and the design of your calls and the effectiveness that your calls have, uh, you know, the matriarch, the trophy wife on the external side, and then, you know, obviously all your diaphragms, um, talk a little bit about, uh, where you're at with your calls and, and your, you know, your design and how all of that's going and the feedback that you get from customers. You bet, Jay. Um, well, yeah, it's been awesome to work with Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls for a decade now. It's hard to believe it's been a decade, but it's, it's been great working with them. Uh, they do a great job in um, manufacturing the calls and taking my ideas and turning those into reality. I'm just always impressed with how we're able to, you know, get, through the process and just come up with great calls. Um, I'm really excited because we're coming up with new calls. We're going to have new calls coming out, I should say, for 2019 that are you know right on the horizon here. Um, so what we have coming out for the first time is a is a grunt tube or a bugle tube, and it's going to be called uh, the Rogue is what it's called. I used it all of this last fall and had great success with it, Jay. I just love the three-dimensional sound and the back pressure that it creates. I've always said that you need to have great back pressure in a tube to get great three-dimensional sound out of it. Um, this I remember this watching <laughs> Camp TV and sending you a text. I said, Bubba, what are you blowing? And send me one right now. And you're like, sorry, Bub, can't do it yet. I'm like, oh, my gosh, what the heck is that bugle? It sounded incredible. And so that's yeah. the rogue. Yeah, it's called the Rogue. Um, we eat, what we did is we even added um, oh, a lip ball ring to it that you can you can carry it with the lip ball ring on it, which I do, which it kind of expands the mouthpiece out just a little wider, or you can take it off and have a narrower mouthpiece. You can run it either way, um, but again, it, it's just great for high pitch three dimensional bugling. It's got the great back pressure for chuckling and grunting. Um, and then with that ring, you can do really good realistic lip balls with that call. And it's, it's not a great, big, cumbersome tube. It's very packable. Um, you know, it's not a little bitty compact, but it's very manageable, um, you know, easy to, easy to pack. It's light, um, but it's just got great, big sound, which I think is awesome. And then on the mouth read diaphragm side, uh, we're coming up with three new reads. 
Um, the first one is called uh, Elk Camp. <laughs> That's real creative, huh? Um, <laughs> the second one is going to be called uh, that one's the, the Elk Camp is going to be designed uh, similar to the Esther Excited in that it's going to be a very very good cow calling read. Uh, then the Royal Point, I will like be the that. next read. The Royal Point, what yep, is it? It's going to be Royal Point it's called the Royal Point. Uh huh. It's okay. going to be a very good bugling, uh, high toned read. Um, it will also be good for, you know, making high tone cow sounds, especially after it's broke in a little bit, but a very good bugling read. And then the uh, third one is going to be called the Times Up. And it's going to be similar to the closer in that it's going to be that double read call with the, with the V cut in it. Um, but the main difference in these reads versus the ones that I currently have is they're being built on a new frame, a new aluminum frame. Uh, called the Golden Tone Plate Frame. And I'm telling you, Jay, I used these reeds all of last fall, and I just absolutely love the tonal quality out of them. I love the consistency and the durability. I mean, there were some days when I absolutely pounded on these reeds with bugling just to try to locate bulls. And we would go out in the morning, and I'd say, well, boys, I can promise you one thing. You're going to hear some bugling today, even if it's just me. And <laughs> absolutely pounded on these reeds and they held up um, and you know for weeks and so I'm just really excited about them because uh, you know you know me I'm not about gimmicks I'm about quality sounds and so I think uh, you and your listeners are really going to love these these three reeds when they come out and this grunt tube as well I'm thinking that they'll be out hopefully February March so plenty of time oh, awesome. to, to get them and get ready for the fall that's great. That's fantastic. I look forward to it. You know, um, it, it, uh, people always send me questions, you know, how do I become a better elk caller? It's real simple. I just say go to, go to Chapel Guide Service or go to YouTube, type in Steve Chapel and watch and listen. And uh, you do a phenomenal job with your instructionals. Uh, best elk caller I know. Uh, phenomenal <laughs> sounds. Very, very real. No gimmicks. Uh, no nonsense, just just pure, pure sounds. And um, I'm glad to hear that you're coming out with some new calls. I'm interested in checking them out. Um, Steve, with that, uh, I've been watching Elk Camp TV. I'm a big fan of the TV show. What is the status of the TV show, and um, how has it been received so far? I, I, I hear people all the time saying how much they love the show. I, I've seen every episode. I, I love what you're doing. Um, talk a little bit about it. You bet, Jay. Yeah, I would say it was a very successful first season. So it aired from July through December. So for those two quarters, and we had 10 episodes. Um, if, if there was any frustration out there, is I think the fact that uh, I and, and people um, don't understand that, you know, when you have 10 episodes, uh, they repeat <laughs> during the two quarters. And so there were some comments about, oh, what are some new episodes? Well, um, that's typical for shows. They're going to have uh, you know, on a two-quarter airing, 10 to 13 episodes, and they're going to rotate and repeat during the process. So there's always opportunity if you've missed one, you know, to see it again at some point. Um, but the feedback was really good. Um, so we went ahead and filmed again, obviously, for season two this past fall. Uh, we got some great hunts on video. Um, many of them that, and, and believe me, this is not how I like it to come down to the bottom of the ninth inning. And some people even said that on the first season. Yeah, it's always on the last day. You know, it's so predictable. <laughs> it's like, that's, <laughs> that's stressful, man. Don't you agree? It's not, it's not Yo, yeah. hard to take it down to the yeah. bottom of the ninth. But that's still how it happened this year on many of the hunts this past year. Um, but those will be uh, edited and, and produced for season two. And we're looking forward to, you know, having Elk Camp Season 2 starting again in early July and then running through December same way. Um, I would imagine that I would have similar air times, but as soon as I know air times for 2019, I'll let you and your listeners know and uh, look for, looking forward to that. It's just a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, that kind of was a springboard off of the Extreme Bulls DVDs. Um, you know, I kind of came to, I guess you could say, the edge of the cliff, and I either had to <laughs> jump or, or, or back off. And uh, as we know, DVDs just kind of died for whatever reason in this digital age. And so 
uh, it was time to make that step in, into TV or, or something else. And so, so I did that. And, uh, you know, it, 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 there's good and bad about it. But uh, overall, very happy that I did it. And uh, I'm very appreciative of everyone who watches the show and all the good feedback. I'm just super blessed. Can't say how much God's blessed me and, and how happy I am about everything. Good, buddy. It's so great to hear you doing great with all of your different businesses. It's, it's, you know, um, it, it seems like you have a bunch of different categories within your elk business, let's call it, or your guiding business, but I love all each little facet of the business has its own, you know, personality, and, and uh, you're doing such a great job. Uh, always love talking to you. Uh, thanks for sharing your knowledge on Arizona and on how the draw works and ha uh, having a great conversation. Uh, I want to give you a chance, Steve, to let the listeners know uh, the best way to get a hold of you to talk about hunts in Arizona, to talk about buying calls, uh, watching your show, whatever it may be. You bet, Jay. Thanks so much. It's been so nice to be on with you as always. And yes, um, probably the best way to get information and find out more about the guide service would be first to, for them to log on to chapelguideservice.com. That's with two P's and two L's. And then if they would like to learn more about the Zero Hunt Fees program, which we've talked about, they can log directly on to zerohuntfees.com. That'll take them straight to those pages on the website about Zero Hunt Fees. And then they can also uh, log on to elkcamptv.com, and that would give them any updated information about the TV show, like as we roll into 2019. Um, they can also uh, find where they can buy hats and T-shirts, Elk Camp hats and T-shirts there. Of course, the Elk Calls are on the website, uh, the chapelguideservice.com website. And on the website, there's direct contact information to me. Uh, my email and my phone number are on there, so people can get a hold of me directly uh, through that website. And uh, again, I just appreciate all the support of your listeners and all the encouragement that I hear from them. Right on, buddy. Well, thanks for sharing, and uh, look forward to seeing the new uh, episodes coming in July. And uh, let's pray for more snow and more rain, more moisture, and look forward to a great uh, season coming up in the fall of 2019. So, uh, Steve, God bless you. Tell the girls hello. Um, love chatting with you as always. And uh, oh, are you going to be at any of the uh, shows? Are you going to be at Western Hunting Expo, or are you going to be at any of them um, where I might see you? down the road yes jay um thank you i will be at the western hunting expo on uh, friday and saturday not all oh, day good. long so early briefly but i will be there okay i'll look forward to seeing cool. you there awesome. i'm gonna i'm gonna be walking around as well so cool well good all right buddy well god bless and uh, i'll catch you later okay god bless you thanks again jay bye